The Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, Hear another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenants and went on a journey. But the tenants seized the servants, and one they beat, another they killed, and a third they stoned. Again, he sent other servants, more numerous than the first ones, but they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, thinking, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and acquire his inheritance. They seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. What will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants when he comes? They answered him, He will put those wretched men to a wretched death and lease his vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the proper times. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? By the Lord has this been done, and it is, it is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that will produce its fruit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Jesus proposes in the Gospel the parable of a landowner who plants a vineyard and who leases it out and goes away. And I'm not sure how long he's gone before um, he asks for his part of the harvest, the produce that rightfully belongs to him. The workers, for whatever reason, maybe they're greedy, but they're very much dissatisfied and discontent with the part that they're supposed to have, the part that rightfully belongs to them, because they want it all. They want the whole vineyard, they want everything. And they say to one another, come, let us kill the son and acquire his inheritance. And that's their thinking. Yet at the end of the parable, even though they kill the son, the vineyard does not become theirs. It never becomes theirs. It has no chance of ever becoming theirs. Whatever kind of false thinking that they have, it, um, it doesn't work out. Even though they um, hatch their plan and they fulfill it according to, their, uh, to the way they had in mind, never happens, never comes to fruition that they eventually inherit or own the vineyard. On one level, the, the parable is very much about how the kingdom of God belongs to all peoples. Jesus came to save all peoples, not just, um, not just Israel in the uh, Old and New Testaments. And so uh, on another, that's on one level. The parable is very much about that, the importance of producing fruit as followers of Jesus Christ and members of God's kingdom. On another level, though, the parable, I think, talks to us about how we view possessions, things that are in some way on loan to us from our God, how you and I are like the tenants in some sense, and how we need to maybe change our perspective on how we view the things of this world. So in the, in the gospel, the parable, the vineyard does not belong to the tenants. It's never theirs from the beginning, not something they planted, not something that they own, and at the end of the parable, it's still not theirs, something they still never own. They enter into an agreement to lease the vineyard, from the, um, the owner in exchange for part of the harvest. And so at the beginning of the, of, of the gospel, it's a mutually beneficial agreement between the tenants and the owner. We'll work the land, we'll give you your part, we live on the land, we work here, we get part of the harvest as well. So in the beginning, it's mutually beneficial, something that they agreed, agreed to right from the beginning. Because the other option for them is to not have a place to live or not have any work whatsoever. And so they're both satisfied in the beginning. The workers accept the agreement. Over time, again, maybe because greed enters into it, they're very dissatisfied, maybe with being an employee and not the owner, and that's when they say to another, one another, let us kill the son, let us acquire his inheritance. So what changed from the time that they said, this is the agreement, we like this agreement, we agree to it, what changed from that moment until the time when they say, I want it all, I want the vineyard itself, this agreement is no longer satisfactory. Maybe it's um, they're dissatisfied with not being the owner themselves. Maybe they just want to have a lot more, not content with what they have. Maybe they're envious in the face of the, um, the owner who everything belongs to him. Maybe they're discontent with doing the work 
and someone else kind of gets more of the benefit, the owner gets more of the benefit while they're the ones doing all the work. Whatever the reason is, their hearts and their minds are completely changed from something that they were satisfied with in the beginning to great discontent at the very end. Maybe for us, without getting into how the gospel might apply to uh, economics and employment policies, either on a world level or closer to home, you can apply that some other time, um, how the gospel works for those kind of things in our world, but maybe looking at how this gospel impacts you and me spiritually today. Important to note from the beginning that there's nothing wrong with owning things with having possessions. And there's nothing wrong with having some of the better things, too. You kind of work your way up to some extent. The point of the gospel is not to own the worst things possible, right? That's not the point of the gospel. But maybe as you look at your own life, reflect on your life, in the beginning, you and I are satisfied with, with simple things in the beginning. Not just in the beginning of our life, but think back to the beginning of your married life. Think of your first car. Maybe you had it a lot longer than you should have, but it's all you could afford, and it worked well enough at the time. Maybe you think about the, around the time of your first child, not much that you could afford, so you kind of got clothing and toys and other things from garage sales, right? That's what you could afford at the time, and there was nothing wrong with that. Maybe you think about the early days of your marriage when you lived in a small apartment, ate simple meals, hardly ever went out, and those were maybe the happiest days of your life. And so what changed since then? What's the difference now? For the better, Hopefully you have safer cars, cars that work a little better, get you where you need to go for sure. For the better, maybe you have a house that fits the size of your family better. Maybe, hopefully, you eat healthier food instead of eating out of cans or TV dinners all the time so that you're able to afford a little bit better food, better quality, good for your health. So those kind of things change for the better. You look for some better things in life. But what changed for the worse? Look at what you have in your life. Are you the slave of all the things that you own where um, it's all about working in order to pay those bills, to pay off the debt that you um, owe on so many different things? What worked if you're not content? What changed if you're not content now with what you have? What's the difference? Because you were content and satisfied in the beginning. What's the difference now? Why is there dissatisfaction or or discontent in your life? Because at a time, in the beginning, it was fine. These things were okay. What's changed for you? There's a point, I think, where people acquire a lot of things, and maybe it's a matter of looking around at those around them and listening to whatever maybe um, whatever ad- ads are out there too. But sometimes there's a certain amount of convincing that takes place that I want a lot more. I'm not happy with what I have. I want what they have. I want what's out there. I want something that's different. I'm not content anymore with what I have. Where do you get to the point, though, where you say enough? I don't need anything more. I have enough. The things I have are just fine. I don't need the best. I don't need the the newest. And in fact, I only don't need the best. I don't even need better than what I have. What I have is just fine. I don't even need the, the medium range things. What I have is just fine. How do you get to that point in your life? And maybe looking at them, the gospel from that kind of spiritual perspective, changing our attitude and our outlook and how we view the things of this world, Maybe three ideas or three things to look at in the weeks ahead. The first maybe is um, maybe when you're thinking about making some purchases in life, not simple things, but some of the bigger things in life. As you step back from your life, if you could do that, and look at the 80 or 90 years that you're going going to live for, you and I, we come into the world with nothing, we leave the world with nothing, exactly the same. So what does that say about the intervening 80 or 90 years? Well, to some extent, we work hard, but those things... You know, some of them existed before we were alive. Many of them exist after we die. A lot of those things are just on loan to us during the time. Um, We hold them in trust. They're on loan to us from God. We hold them in trust to some extent for other people. Maybe they're things you're going to give to your family. You're going to will to your children. Maybe they're ways that you help other people as well. Or maybe they're things that you use for the benefit of strangers. Things you're going to give away to people you don't even know. But the idea of looking at Um, the whole perspective that the things that we have to some extent are on loan loan to us, we simply hold them in trust because they don't go with us at the end of time. Maybe a second idea, um, the idea of of generosity with our possessions, especially in the face of hoarding many things. So if you look at the things in your house or the things that you possess, um, how many things do you really need to own? Um, Do you really need more stuff? Do you have enough now? 
And maybe a simple idea could be that when you acquire something new, not, again, not the basic things in life, maybe when you buy one new thing, get rid of two things. When you buy a microwave, get rid of two other things in the house. The idea that um, some things are not being used anymore, and I don't need to hoard the possessions of this earth, but again, these are other things can be used for, maybe other people can use these things. And at the least, at least I change my perspective. Maybe no one can use those other things, fine. They're not, they're, they can't be used by anybody, that's fine. But the perspective changes where I don't need to keep requiring all kinds of things. So maybe on the third, a third way, and maybe the most important one, just looking at discontent and dissatisfaction in your own life. And not necessarily just with respect to the things and possessions of the world, but just general dissatisfaction and discontent in your life, if that's where you find yourself at all. Because our life also is a gift from God. Right? And a gift that hopefully we're content and satisfied with. That doesn't mean that we don't try to do better. We try to improve our minds and grow in holiness and faith. Of course we should do those things. However, even beyond our possessions, there are some people who are just very much dissatisfied, unhappy with their lives. There are a lot of things in this world to be dissatisfied about. Many, many things. Um, poverty that's well, far away from home. Poverty that's close to home. It could be a, a lack of jobs for those who um, honestly seek them, a lack of peace in our world, in our neighborhoods, maybe the level of education for our, our young, younger generations, whatever it might be, there are a lot of things to be dissatisfied with in life. But I don't think one of them is the fact that you don't own certain things, that you and I don't own certain things. I'm not sure that's a, a really worth our discontent and our dissatisfaction. And then ultimately, going beyond possessions, there's a certain amount where we um, look at our own lives, we step back, we review our own lives, and maybe it's not all we wanted or maybe not even all God wanted for us, fine. But at some point, we're thankful and grateful to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the life I have, for the years that I've lived. I didn't have to have any years. I didn't have to make it to my first birthday or my fifth birthday, and here I am. I made it to many more birthdays than that. To be grateful to the Lord for what you do have. Can you get to an attitude and a perspective on your own life where you're somewhat satisfied, where you're content, where there's a general, a general happiness and joy in your life. Not that there aren't bad days, but in general, you're happy and content with your life. In the end, the parable of the vineyard is, is very much the story of stewardship. It begins with the recognition that this vineyard isn't mine. These things in life aren't mine. My life and extent is not mine. It's all a gift from God. And the things I have in my life, including my life, they're on loan to me for a time, and I hold them in trust, the things of this world, for the benefit of other people first, and lastly, for my benefit. And I'm okay with that. I'm satisfied with the little bit that I have, the little bit that works in my life. I'm satisfied and content with my own life. Can you get to that attitude? Can you get to that, get to that perspective on the things that you have and on your life itself?